Ezra in chapter number 9. We're going to be reading just a few short verses, um, verses 6 through 9. Ezra chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. reads, And I said, this is Ezra, O oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for, iniquity, and for our inequities, we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the, of the lands, to the sword, to the captivity, to the plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God has enlightened our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. For we were slaves, yet our God did not forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to rebuild its ruins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you, God, for your goodness. And thank you, Lord, for this time to gather and to hear your word and to worship you, my Lord, and to give unto you. And we ask, Lord, that today that you would stir in us, that you would move in us, my God, and, and revive us as we just read here, my Lord, that you would revive every single person here, my Lord, to do more for you, to be on fire for you, to, Father, to speak for you, to do for you, to serve for you, to love for you. Father, begin moving on us now. I believe you've already started, my Lord, with the worship earlier. Continue the work in us, my Lord. Continue to strive and move us. Open our ears to hear and soften our hearts to receive the word you have for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the saints said, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. I, 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 I was inspired and moved by this because this week, I, I just had, and I don't know exactly when it happened, maybe it's a couple weeks old or something, but there's a school district in Texas, at Keller, Keller ISD, and Keller ISD was pulling some books from their library, from the public school system, pulling it from their libraries to be reviewed and reconsidered for use in their school district. And one of the books was a, a picture portrayal of the diary of Anne Frank. And if you don't know the story of Anne Frank, she... She was a, uh, a, a Jewish girl in hiding during World War II, and she had kept a diary, and it became a published book, and, and it, it speaks a lot about you know, the atrocities of World War II towards the evilness towards the Jewish people, towards God's people, but also it spoke, it spoke of her, her, her strength and her faith in God, and, and, it, and it's a wonderful portrayal, but they were pulling this off the shelf, and, and also another book that they were pulling off the shelf in the library. They have it in the library for you to read, is the Bible. They're pulling the Holy Bible. And, and one of the complaints about the Holy Bible is because of its violence and its um, war, uh, depictions of war, it complained about being homophobic and expressing sexual immorality. And yet I'm thinking, okay, so you don't like that it's homophobic. It's speaking out against sexual immorality, but you're saying the book is sexually immoral. So I, I, you know, I read these things and I'm thinking, how is this happening? How is this happening in our society that, that God's word is now being removed from, from bookshelves and saying that you, know, you, you cannot read this because it's, it's, it's unhealthy, it's ungodly, it, it, it promotes violence, it promotes hatred. And, <coughs> excuse me. and so I, I, was, I was really stirred by this. I think, what, what, what's happened to us? And I, I started thinking about you know, what, what's coming up with the upcoming elections, and not to make this a political campaign or anything like that, because there is, but there is a precedence in the scripture of believers being in positions of office, of authority. It, it, it's, it's there, it's scriptural. I mean, Joseph, in the book of Genesis, he was second to Pharaoh. You know, that would be like a, a vice president or lieutenant governor, whatever level of authority you're talking about, but he's second in command, right? <clears throat> and then you have like Daniel. Daniel gets elevated to basically being a, a, a governor of the providence of, 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 ba of Babylon. And, and Daniel, Daniel's elevated. Esther, she's the queen of Persia. She's married to the king. She's right there. You, we see what, if you know the story of Esther, because of her influence on the king, 
the, the Jewish people were spared because they were allowed to defend themselves. Why? Because she was in a position of authority and office, right? And, and then, of course, you know, we have the kings of Israel and many, many, the, the good ones. There weren't a lot of them, unfortunately. Uh, I, I've told you, I've shared with you before, there is only seven recorded faithful kings of, of, of the 42 kings in, in all of the books of Kings and Chronicles. Only seven of them were considered deemed faithful and godly. And two of them were, were, were David and, and Solomon. And now Solomon, at the end of his end days, kind of kind of went off the rails a little bit, but, but he, he made his way back. But, but, uh, but so, so there, there's, a, there's a biblical precedence of holding office and being in a position of authority. And, and we shouldn't undermine that, and, and we shouldn't undermine, but, but that should not be our sole source of affecting change in our lives and the lives around us. You cannot legislate morality. You can only eradicate immorality. And the only way you eradicate immorality is you expose it to light. You expose it to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world, and whoever walks with me will not walk in darkness. And, and so we need to walk in the light. We need to be the light. We need to share the light so that way darkness then flees. Again, I, I, I've been one of these people, I've been all for defunding uh, Planned Parenthood, but as long as a young lady thinks that she has no hope and no way out, then she's going to look to Planned Parenthood. But if we give her hope and we give her a way out, then she no longer needs to go to Planned Parenthood. And then Planned Parenthood will shut down on its own because there'll be no need for it. And that's why I say we need to eradicate the immorality. We can pass law after law after law. The Supreme Court can make decisions upon decisions, but if the hearts of people do not change, then immorality will continue to reign, right? And so we need to understand and, and know that we have authority in Christ, and we need to, we need to, to stop putting away the light. Because this is what we do a lot. As Christians, we put away the light. We put away Jesus so as not to offend. We just heard Brother Johnny here. I'm telling you, he's in the trenches. He was being very, very, I guess, respectful to time. But if you were to, if you were to spend some time with him, I'm sure, and I haven't spoken to him, but I'm sure there's some horrid stories about people coming against him, speaking ill against him, just being difficult. Just trying to apply even for a filming permit. Because, you know, you got to go in you, these cities where you go film. Am I right, Brother John? you got to apply for permits. you got to get the city's permission that you're going to come in and bring in a work crew and you're going to do work there. It's not that easy. You just don't set up a camera like these vloggers do. Like and subscribe, Josiah Obergon. You know, you, just, you don't just walk around pop up with a camera. you got to go through these permitting processes. And cities can be a hindrance. They can be, anybody had that person at work? You know, like the boss's administrative assistant? who, 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 who uh, uh, deflects everything. You know, you want to say, no, nope, he's not available. Well, I just saw him come back from lunch. He, he's in a meeting, you know. His door is open. Uh, he's going to be in a meeting. You know, and, and, people, and, and there's people like this in these positions of authority, in these city offices and things like that. Do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? And, and so, so this is not anything, you know, that, that is easy to do. And so when we walk out there in faith, walking out there in the things of God, we got to put the light out. We got to shine the light. It's like this. Anybody, okay, you young people, you don't know who, you don't know who Dirty Harry is, all right? But he is, he is uh, the, the baddest cop ever, all right? And he's, uh, Clint Eastwood, and you just know him as an old guy now. But Clint Eastwood, and I mean, don't take this wrong, I, you know, but when he was young, he was a good looking guy, right? <laughs> but, uh, but when he was Dirty Harry, right, he would just say, he just pull out. He brought. He wasn't trying to get into a fist fight with it. He just pulled out this a three fifty seven Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world. He goes, and I was, and I, I will, and I, I don't remember what else he'd say, but you know, but you know, do you, you feel lucky? But he didn't. He didn't waste any time. He right away pulled out the big gun. He pulled out the big gun. We need to stop playing around and and trying to you know defend and deflect and be nice. Pull out the big gun. Pull out Jesus and say, wait a minute. Say, wait a minute, Christ is for me. In fact, we heard Johnny, Johnny was just quoting. Uh, in fact, both Pastor Jason and Johnny were, were, were stepping on the sermon today. But that tells me that God is speaking. Tells me that God is speaking. 
because we're going to get to to Acts and what happened in Acts in a little bit later. But Johnny was sharing from from 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if you have Christ in you, that's the big gun. That's the 357 Magnum. That's the thing that you need. That's when you get asked the devil, do you feel lucky? (laughs) You know? You're probably asking, was it five shots or six shots? Amongst all the commotion, I forgot myself. Right? But, but this is what we got to do. We got to pull out the book. We got to pull out Christ who's in us. Stop hiding the light. Stop suppressing him. Stop keeping him down. What we need is a title for this sermon. The title for this sermon is Your Revival is Our Revival. What we need is revival within us. We need revival in us. So because when you're, when you're putting away the light, that's not revival. Where there's revival, there's light. There's commotion. I was, I was um, um, my, my daughter was showing me, hey, what do you think about this slide for the, uh, you know, for the graphic? And I said, okay, yeah, that's good. You know, I, I was, I didn't want to tell her before, I was thinking of like a tent because I'm thinking of tent revival, right? Now, you young people, again, don't know what we're talking about, about tent revivals, right? But, but, but there, when, when you would know when there was a revival going on in town, any, any, any people my age plus, right? You remember? When, there, when you saw a white tent go up, like, there's going to be revival. I'm, I'm going to go. Anybody see the new Elvis movie? Every hand should be raised in this house of God right now. <laughs> so in, in that Elvis movie, they show a young Elvis running to the tent revival where, 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 where praise and worship was happening and the Holy Ghost was moving. And it shows him, shows him in there experiencing the Holy Ghost. In fact, the minister says, leave him alone. He's got the Holy Ghost. And he, and he says that. And, and but when you saw these tents, you knew there was revival. You knew something was happening. And, and that's what should happen. Everywhere we go, there should be revival. There should be, they, they should recognize us. You know, all these guys I mentioned earlier, Joseph and Daniel and, and Queen Esther and, and, you know, so- Solomon and David, right? They all had, they all had an eternal, they had an eternal revival in them. They had fire burning in them. Because with Esther, she was risking her life. If you read the story, it was, if you approached the king uninvited, in that kingdom, it, it could mean your death. And so she took it upon, what, what did that? Fire within her, desire for the people of God, a desire for God, revival, revival was in her, fire was burning in her. All right, but, but yet for some reason, we think we need to have a tent. We think we need to have a stadium event. We think we need to have some big old giant crusade for revival to happen. But revival doesn't need to be a crusade or a tent. It doesn't need to even be a church meeting. It's something that happens within us, inside of us. Right in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 6, it reads, in the ESV version, it reads, fan the flame. Fan, you gotta feed the fire. You gotta feed the fire with the things of what? The things of God in your life. So that, that fire burns bright in you. So that, that you, that, that you don't, don't put away the light. You gotta let that light shine, right? And what does fire also do? Fire produces smoke. And then just last week, and I, I was talking, last Sunday, I spoke a little bit about Second Chronicles in chapter five and verses 13 and 14, or is it 12? Yeah, 13 and 14, where it speaks about that the glory of God was so great in the temple that the, that the priests could not perform their duties, right? But I, and I, I see that, and it, and it speaks about the glory of God being this cloud, that the glory of God was a cloud. And I see the cloud, I think of smoke, and where there's fire, there's smoke. Right? And so, and so there, there should be, if, if, there was, if there was smoke there in the temple, that means there was fire. There was a burning desire. And you know who had that burning desire? King Solomon. Because if you read earlier in that chapter, in, in, in second, um, I'm, I'm sorry, second Chronicles, did I say Corinthians earlier? I said Chronicles, praise the Lord. I don't want to play that rookie mistake. All right, so two different books. All right, second Chronicles in chapter five and verse six, it speaks about he did a multitude of sacrifices that were beyond measure. You couldn't count them. See, King Solomon understood the Lord required sacrifice. And so King Solomon went out and he got hundreds, hundreds of cattle, hundreds of cattle to bring the sacrifice. He says, this is pleasing to God. This is pleasing to God. My wife loves stargazer lilies. And so if I have the money, I'm going to fill the house with stargazer lilies. Do you understand? You love your wife. She loves roses. You don't just buy one rose. If you could, you're going to feel that. She's going to be like, oh my, this is beautiful. Look at what you did for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Solomon understood. He goes, 
No, God loves the animal sacrifice, so I'm going to bring thousands of animal sacrifices. And so this is what happened. We oftentimes will we'll read about this here in, in uh, verses 13 and 14, that the glory of God was so great at the priest. But what happened beforehand? They were praising God with the sacrifice. He was coming with an abundance of sacrifice. He was giving everything to God. He just, he just didn't sit back and say, okay, God, show up. Give me something. He was giving to God, and God was pleased. And then God showed up with his glory and said, and they, they, couldn't, they couldn't do, they couldn't even perform their duties. They couldn't perform a service. They couldn't go through their, their ritual practices because the glory of God was so great. Like today here when the worship team was singing, and it was, and I could tell that that, that song wasn't, well, I know songs were on the set list. And then that one song wasn't on the set list. Um, Brother um, JJ was just moved to, to go there with that song. And it just went there, and we just, we probably went an extra, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it was. You know, because God was just moving. And we're moving. And why? Because we're allowing that fire to be fanned in us. And so that way it'll burn bright. So that way we can move and move in the things of God. But, but we, we have to understand this. And, I, and I, I gave you this example here in 2 Chronicles chapter 5 about the glory being in the temple. But Paul makes it very clear. He asks us, well, he asks a question to us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verse 16, he says, do you not know? This is why I said the title, right? Your revival is our revival. He says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That the Holy Spirit dwells within you? And so you are the temple? And so within you should be that glory cloud, right? And then we together, am I skipping out here? And we, we together with that glory cloud within us, right? We should, we should then be growing and filling this whole place. And, and then that's why wherever you go, wherever you go, there should be church. Wherever you should go is the glory of God. Where, that's why wherever you step is holy ground, as Moses was told. Everywhere he goes, everywhere we go should be holy ground because Christ is within us. And then, and then and people should be experiencing that and moving, that, moving in that direction. This, this, word, this word revive, revival, isn't found a lot in the scriptures. But here, as in our opening set of verses, you know, we read here in verse number eight where, where it reads, um, Lord God, to leave us as a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a re measure of revival in our bondage. Revival in our bondage. We are, we are, when we are bound, if you want to be set free, you need revival. And remember just a few weeks ago when we were speaking about we uh, worship being our weapon and we spoke about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, and what happened at the midnight hour? At the midnight, no, love didn't come tumbling down. At the midnight hour, right, the chains came tumbling down. The walls came tumbling down. I was just giving an old secular song. It's good you didn't know it. That's fine, we'll move right along. All right, so, and what happened? The chains came off because why? They praised and they glorified God. But back here to, to Ezra, chapter 9, verse 9, it reads, to revive us. To revive us, repair the house of our God to rebuild its ruins. If your house is ruined, if you need repairing, you need to be revived. And you need to be revived by the things of God. This is what you need. You need to be revived. Because I, as I was sharing with you earlier about what was happening in the school district, right, and with, a lot, with our culture, with our schools, um, with entertainment, what's happened? It's in a coma. They're on life support. They're, why? Because they don't have Christ in them. They need to be revived. They need, they need, you know, CPR. They need to be revived. They need to be brought back to life so that way they, they, that these things, these schools and these, these, ent these, these entities and organizations are operating for the kingdom of God. They need to be revived. And the way they're revived and they're infused with Christ, and that comes through you, by you getting involved, by you being there and going to those places and getting involved. All right. We have to understand is all these things that are greatly influenced. As I said the, the culture with what's happening now with, with us being forced to accept uh, the, these immoral activities and lifestyles. Uh, just, you know, I, you know, I, I just saw uh, this, this footage of, it was, you remember when they, a few years ago they had those, what do they call flash dance parties? They would just show up somewhere and, and do a dance. I got a mall. What, what were they called? Flash mobs. Thank you. Flash mobs. Flash dance was a movie. Or something like that. Anyways, so flash. Well, now, now they have flash looting, I guess. A group of people showed up at a store all one time. Did anybody see this? And they showed up at the store, and they looted the store, knowing that ain't no one going to stop us. 
Let's defund the police because they're not going to stop us. So let's go show up to the store. Let's just loot the store. And, and, and they're like celebrating. I'm thinking, did, did not anybody, did not any mo- mother or father teach that child? This is wrong. You don't break into someone's store and steal and loot and take from them. Right? But why? what's happened? Because Christ has been removed. We have removed Christ. And so I said, we need, we need to be that revival. We need to be uh, that, that shot of adrenaline, if you would, to get somebody up and breathing again. We need reviving. Our society needs reviving. But we, again, your revival is our revival. I, I, I longed, if only we could have filmed everything last night and let you all just go home and watch what we experienced with these young people and sharing their testimonies last night. I was moved. I told my wife, this is one of the most powerful things I've ever experienced ever in ministry. To see these young people honor all these volunteers. My wife and I, we're, we're not volunteers of the youth. I, I was just, I was humbled that I was even asked to be there. Because Pastor Mike and Kim and the other leaders, Alexis and James and Elizabeth and Marquise and all the other leaders, do they, they're the ones that are sewing in week after week. You know, we're just the guys that open the door and let them come in. That, that's the only part I play. Right, but, but to see them honor like that, I, I, was, I, I was, again, I was moved. I was I, I was, I, I, I can't tell you enough of what I saw and experienced. I wish you could have seen it. It was, it was beautiful, but I, I was thinking about this is, this is what our, our body needs. Our body needs to be revived. They need to see these young people. So when you guys are, when you see seats in the second and third row that are walking, that are available because you came in 10 minutes late, know that they belong to the youth. They're all up here worshiping God, all right? And, and so when you come in, oh, there's a seat up front. Well, no, not really. They're all up here worshiping God. They're gonna come back to their seats. That's why I tell you guys, Bring a Bible. Doesn't have to be on your phone. Just use it as a seat reserver, you know? Just there, I, I'm sitting here. Brother Jack comes in every Sunday morning early, walks in, sets his Bible down, then goes back out there and greets you at the door. But he walks in, puts his Bible down, paper Bible, all right, puts it down, and saves a seat and goes on back and serves. Right? But, but what we need, we need, we need, to, we need revival. We need, we need to be awakened. We need to be revived within our spirit. R.A. Torrey, he was a, a good friend of D.L. Moody, of, of D.L. Moody uh, Bible Institute. Uh, D.L. Moody was a great evangelist, well-known. Well, he, D.L. Moody, greatly respected R.A. Torrey. And I'm, I'm now changing my name to R.J. Obergon, just so I can be a, some great evangelist someday. But, but, but R.A. Torrey spoke specifically about revival. And here's what he wrote. This is, this is you know, over 100 years ago. He writes, let a few of God's people, they don't need to be many, get thoroughly right with God themselves. The rest will count for nothing unless you start right there. He says, get right. He says, get right, or else nothing else is going to work after that. He says, if if you don't get right, if you don't get right, nothing else is going to work. And then he goes on, then let them band together. He wrote this 100 years ago. Let them band themselves together to pray for revival until God opens up the heavens and comes down. And when I hear that band together, I think of Matthew 18, 19, right? When two or three are in agreement, it is done. It is done on earth as it is in heaven. But we got to be in agreement together, speaking in agreement for it to be done. Do not underestimate the value of your words and what you have to say. You, are, you're, you need to speak. You need to speak what the Lord has called you to do or what the Lord's impressing upon your heart. You can't stay silent. And this is what happens. This is why we put away the light. This is why school districts are now pulling books like the Diary of Anne Frank off the bookshelves because we stay quiet. Now, there's, starting to be an, there's been an uprise recently. People are kind of waking up and re- realizing we got to do something. They're taking they're, they're, they're taking God out of our culture entirely. And this is why movies like Running the Bases, we need to support to say, oh, no, we're not going to go away silently in the night. We're not going to go away without a fight. We're going to continue to support the things of God and back the things of God. Amen? And so he goes on to write. He says, then, he says, then let them put themselves at God's disposal to use them as he sees fit. That will bring a, that, he says, that will bring a revival to any church or any community. And so I took this writing from R.A. Torrey, all right, and I, I took it and I, I broke it down to three, three keys of revival. 
Now, and when, when I speak about these revivals, I want you to recognize these revivals as how they will impact and affect you. Because I said your revival is going to be our revival. Because revival starts with one. It really does. It starts with one. And, 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 and we're, going to, we're going to show you this here in a little bit. But revival starts with one. And you got to be willing to act and, and move on that. Right? So the first key to revival, again, what he was writing here, he, he spoke about to get right with God. That means you need to repent. You got to repent of sin in your life. You got to repent of ungodliness in your life. You need to repent of laziness in your life. Ouch. I, I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating here. I was so, it was, it was a really, really busy week for me. We had some, we had some construction going on here. I don't know if you saw, but our, our tech booth has all been expanded now. So our media team can actually now, actually I move their elbows and reach for something without knocking over something. And, and, and we, we had some construction going on here this week. I had some construction going on in my house this week. You know, I, I had uh, several events down at the Houston campus this week. I'm running back and forth. I, I, yesterday I, we were invited to this event that the youth were putting on to honor the volunteers. I didn't have the sermon even done yet last night. And, I, and I'm, I'm just, it was just one of those things. And, and I was up late finishing the sermon, not till like after midnight. And then I'm here this morning going over the notes again and, and making some changes. And, and it happens every Sunday morning. I, you know, this as things get into me and the Lord's just kind of speaking and I, I make adjustments and, and so forth, it drives the media team crazy. Say, hey, can you add this verse, drop that verse, put this verse there, and we'll move this verse there. And they're like, why do you even give me anything? I mean, it's just like, you're changing it all anyways. But, but, I, but, but this is a true statement. But I was so caught up with making all those changes that it was in the middle of praise and worship and I realized, Lord, I, I haven't even prayed for the service yet, Lord. And I'm sitting there in praise and worship and I'm thinking, I haven't even prayed yet. And so I started asking, Lord, Lord, please just touch your people right now. Let them know your love. Let them know your presence. Let them, let them come in into your, into your loving arms this day, Lord. And, and, I, and during the praise and worship, I was there praying. What I should have done earlier, because what, because what we allow ourselves to get busy. And when I say I repent of our laziness, because we need to prioritize the things of God. We need to make the things, we got to make those priorities. I know this. When I start my day with prayer and, and some word, my day just goes better. I find myself when I don't, and those are the days that seem all, you know, discombobulated and all, you know, packed with, you know, just confusion and stress and worry, and I got to say, whoa, hit the brakes. I need to pray. But so, so what I'm saying here, the first key revival is you need to repent. You need to repent within yourself. In Nehemiah 8.6, when they were reading the word of God, in Nehemiah 8, 6, it reads, they were lifting their hands and they bowed their heads with their faces to the ground. That was a sign of, of them repenting. They were hearing the word. They hadn't heard the word in years. They had been in captivity. They had not heard the word. They'd been in captivity. They're coming back. And actually, Ezra is reading the word there in Nehemiah chapter 8. Ezra is the priest. Nehemiah, is, in a sense, is the king. He's the governor. Nehemiah is, is the, the leader of this effort. But, it, but the people bowed down. And they put, turned their faces to the ground. That was a form of repentance of them saying, Lord, we're sorry. We've neglected you. We've forgotten you. Right? And this is what we need to do. And, and, and Jesus', is, Jesus is very first message in ministry, when Jesus goes, he gets, he gets water baptized and reads, as soon as he came out of the waters of baptism, Jesus goes in the wilderness for 40 days. You probably know the story. And he faces the, 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 the devil. And he defeats the devil with what? The word of God. It is written the devil tempts him three times. He gives him the word of God. It is written, it is written, it is written. He defeats the devil. But when he comes back from that, that's when he begins the ministry. And the very first message that he is recorded and speaking is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And his message is, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's Jesus' first message is repent. Not, I'm love. God is love. He says, repent. It says, repent, get, turn away from your sin. And if you need revival, you need to turn away from your sin. You need to turn away from those things that are keeping you from God. The second item here when, when, that R.A. Torrey was speaking about, he says, band themselves together. Band themselves together. Nehemiah, back to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. It's a wonderful scripture, a wonderful chapter about praise and worship. 
And it reads that now all the people gathered together as one man. The people gathered as one man. They were as one. They were as one. And then they were, they were, what were they doing? They were worshiping God. They were praising God, which takes us to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Where's Pastor Jason, who was, who was still in from the sermon today? He must have saw my notes, all right? But he reads in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, in the King James Version, they were all in one accord. They were one. They were together. They were embodied. They were connected together. I said, this is point number two, right? They are to, we are to connect, right? The first one is repent. Point number two is connect. They were in one accord. They were connected together. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30, speaks that what? That one can send 1,000 to flight, but two can send 10,000 to flight. But when you're connected together, when you're drawn together, you can do so much more for the kingdom. I've said this before in the past. There's no lone rangers in Christ. Even if you think you're a lone ranger in Christ, the lone ranger had Tonto. So even he, was, even he wasn't alone. So don't think you can do it by yourself. He calls for us to be together, to be united. With that act, an of act of being in one accord in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, just later on down in verse 41, what happens? 3,000 were saved. 3,000 souls were saved that day when what? When what? When what? When they were together in one accord. One accord when they were, when they were connected. So again, point number two, you need to be connected. And point number three, you need to accept. Repent, connect, and accept. Accept God's assignment, right? R.A. Torrey wrote, he, they put themselves at God's disposal. Do, do you understand what that means? To put yourself at God's disposal. Say, God, what do you want me to do, Lord? But so often we're telling God what we want. Like I was sharing with you about the building next door. Well, here's my plan, God. This building would be great. It's right next door. We can just build a bridge. It's good. We can, this, is, this would be good, God. This is, this is a good plan. But it's not necessarily God's plan, right? And so we, we got to hear, we got to hear from God what God wants and say, God, what do you want? As Jesus said in the garden, thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will. And so we got to be willing to accept God's assignment. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6, as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That is key. Don't begrudgingly go do what you think God wants you to do. It reads here, but do it from the heart. Say, Lord, that's what you want, then that's what I'm going to do. And this is, and this is, and this is how we need to operate. We got to submit ourselves to God and do it with a loving heart, realizing and recognizing that God knows better than you. Yeah, but God, that building's right there, and this makes a lot more sense. No, it makes my sense. Remember, we're we're, we're a year and a half old. We've already had to go buy a second set of chairs. Right? And as Pastor Jason said, we're almost ready to buy some more chairs. Right? So maybe next door isn't enough. For our God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he owns those hills that those cattle are on. So he has maybe greater things for us. And so we just need to be obedient and continue to, to be moving according to his will, not our will. Right? I, and and I, 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 there's opportunities all around us to be witnesses for the gospel all around. There was a brother in this church, he, he's, he's, a, he's, he's an ER nurse, and about every two weeks or so, we have, we have cases of Bibles that were given to us, and we give them out to visitors and guests and so forth, and he's, he says, hey, Roger, I've been witnessing at work and giving people Bibles. Uh, do you have any more? So like every two weeks, he comes in for like three or four more Bibles because he's witnessing at work and giving people Bibles. And I told him, brother, you, we'll, keep, we'll, keep, we'll keep a supply for you. Everywhere you go is an opportunity for you to, to do what the Lord has called you to do, to accept the assignment. We don't have to have a burning bush experience. I've said this many times over the years. I've never had the burning bush experience. I never had the road to Damascus experience. I've, I've never, you've never heard me say to people, yes, the Lord told me to pastor you. I've never, I just was just going where the Lord was leading me. The Lord to open a door, I'm like, okay. And he opened this door, okay. And I just kept going through the doors. I just kept taking the assignments he was putting before me. And this is what you need to do. 
take the assignment that's before you. There's another, there's another person in this church here. She, she calls it a, um, a radar for the, for the needy and the homeless, that she could just find them. I said, no, it's not a radar. It's a magnet. She pulls them in. She draws them in. They, they find her. She's, they're walking by, and they like, they're drawn to her, and they come to her. She thinks she's going to them. They're going to you, sister, because your love you have and the compassion you have for them. And so she's got, she, she, is, she has fully, recently fully furnished someone's apartment through your contributions and donations. Not, we're not up here taking up an offering every week to make this thing happen. She's out here just doing ministry with those that come across in her life. That's ministry, but she's just being obedient and accepting the assignment that God has given her. And this is, these are the opportunities we have. You know, the great awakening of the 1720s and through like 1740s, that great awakening, you know what was written about that great awakening? The reason why it had to happen? And, and it, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and they spoke about that the ministers of that day were not converted. That the ministers of that day were in ministry for the purpose of vocation and education. Because most of the, high, the institutions of higher education, the universities and colleges, back then, Yale, Harvard, all, all, those were seminaries. And so people went to school to get an education and said, well, I guess I'll be a minister. But they didn't have born-again experiences. And so churches were just functioning, functioning as churches, as church bodies, but the ministers themselves were not converted. And so along come uh, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, and, and, they're just, and they're speaking from the heart. They're speaking from a fire within, from a revival that's happened within them, and lives are being changed by the hundreds and thousands. Because why? Because the fire is burning within them. If I can have the musicians make their way up, please. These men were relentless. These men, they, they were, John Wesley, for example, over in England, well, at the same time when Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield were here, John Wesley was over in England. It is written that, it is that, that John Wesley wrote about nearly 200,000 miles on horseback to go take the gospel to people. That he would, read, he would read while riding to make his time more efficient. Because if, if he knew he had a six-hour ride to the next town, he'd spend that time reading the word while he was on, on his horseback. These men were key to the awakening. And, and, and there was this, this, this poet from that period in the 1730s, 1740s, his name is Lawrence Tribble, and he wrote this poem. I want, to, I want to share this poem with you. Keeping in mind what I read to you about R.A. Torrey, the evangelist, and later on became president of the D.L. Moody Bible Institute. But keep in mind what, what, what I, I, I read from him, all right, and what I was saying here about these points, about to repent. Um, now I feel like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rick Perry. Uh, but repent, connect, and accept. Repent, connect, and accept. Listen to this from Lawrence Tribble. One man awake awakens another. The second awakens his next door brother. Three awake can rouse the town by turning it upside down. The many awake can cause such a fuss. It finally awakens the rest of us, one man up with dawn in his eyes, surely then he multiplies. But it starts with one. It starts with you. It starts with you. You, you, each and every one of you. Revival starts with you. And you will awaken your neighbor. And then you'll turn a whole town upside down. Stand to your feet, please. Give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. As we close, remind you to repent, connect, and accept. Repent from the ungodly activity in your life. It may not necessarily be sin, but binge watching. Instead of being in your word, instead of praying for somebody. It's written of Whitfield that he would pray six, eight hours at a time praying for souls. Can you do that? Can you pray as Jesus said to the disciples? Can you pray one hour?
then connect. Connect with your brothers and sisters. Be like-minded. For two are better than one. Jesus sent them out two by two. Jesus didn't send them out by himself. Send them out two by two. There's no lone rangers in Christ. Be connected. One can put a thousand to flight. Two can send ten thousand to flight. Then accept. Accept whoever it is he puts in your path. Whoever he puts before you, accept that assignment. Don't run from it. Don't say it's not my job. God put it there for a reason. God put you there in that spot, at that moment, for that one person. And as Brother Johnny even shared earlier, always remember this. If you're fearful and you're concerned and you don't know what to do, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ is in you. With every head bowed, I'm going to ask if there's anybody here today who's never given their life to Jesus Christ. That today is the day of your salvation. That you're hearing these things today and you don't even understand what it all means. I'll ask you this. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, you need forgiveness. You don't know whether you're going to heaven or not. Then you need to come up here today. Today. Most of these people here in this place have done this before in their lives. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Be bold. Be brave. Come forward. It will change not only your life, it will change your eternity. You will have eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, if you make that decision to come forward. If you need to rededicate your life, if you've fallen away, just as we heard earlier today, he said he grew up in the church but kind of went away for a while, but he came back and rededicated his life. He got baptized as a a grown man, an adult, was baptized. You can do that. Come here and rededicate your life today. Thank you. And now this altar is open to anybody. Anybody and anyone who's got any need, marital issue, relationship, job situation, you're dealing with um, your health, someone else's health, someone else's relationship, come to the altar. Come stand with one of these altar workers, and they will stand with you in agreement. Matthew 18, 19. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for your goodness. Father, revive us. Father, fan the flame in us. My God, move in us. Let us burn bright for you. Father, move on your people. Let them not be ashamed of the gospel. But Father, also, as you move on them to go out there and do your work, Father, if they have a need, let them not be ashamed and afraid, but let them come. For there is no condemnation in you, my Lord. We know that. So let us come for whatever our need is move amongst your people, my God. We love you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for this day and this gathering. Bless everyone who's here in attendance today, anyone watching online, anyone hearing this message. Let them be moved and inspired, my Lord, to be revived. For revival starts with us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think you see you.